Looking for inspiring destinations, incredible places to stay, and the most exciting bucket list experiences to travel to next? Welcome to Destination Everywhere with hospitality and travel entrepreneurs Todd Bloodworth and Andy McNeil. Having traveled to over 100 countries, Todd and Andy bring you unique perspectives with celebrities in the know, hospitality experts, and native connoisseurs to discover must-dos and inspirational destinations to plan your next trip for business or pleasure. So pack your bags and get ready as we bring you Destination Everywhere with Todd and Andy. Oh, beautiful for spacious skies, for amber waves of grain, for purple mountain majesties. More than just words, this is the reality. America is truly beautiful, and if you're a shutterbug, Instagrammer, or simply enjoy the nostalgia when looking at a timeless image, this episode is for you. Today we focus on listeners who have dreamed of taking a photo journey of America's most moving destinations, hotels, landmarks, and vistas. Today we hope to give you insight on those top photograph destinations in and out of the United States. Today we are interviewing Susan Goldberg. National Geographic's first female editor-in-chief. She's sharing the story of Nat Geo's newest book, America the Beautiful, A Story in Photographs. We will be talking to her about her experiences with this historic publication. We will also share some of the most iconic and photographed places to fill your social media feed and your exploration need. If a stateside staycation is in your future, today's episode is sure to inspire your local bucket list. Welcome to this episode of Destination Everywhere, America the Beautiful. Welcome, everyone, to Destination Everywhere. I'm Andy McNeil, along with my partner in crime, Todd Bloodworth. And do we have a show for you today? We are so excited to uh, have our guest, a very special guest, uh, Susan Goldberg, the editor-in-chief of National Geographic. We yes. are going to be talking to her about a new uh, coffee table book that they are putting out that is promoting America the Beautiful. And everybody remembers National Geographic from growing up. Uh, Todd, what are your first memories? Uh, well, <laughs> well, honestly, um, you know, my, my first memories, we were talking about this. And, and you know, it's, it's so, you know, the reality. Um, but when you're a kid and your library has National Geographic and you're looking through it and you see pictures, you know, you're, you're usually doing a, a, a paper on, you know, like yeah. writing about tigers. I remember, or writing I remember actually ripping out the, the articles and the photos and putting them on poster board as a kid. Well, yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, but then you also you flip through the page. And I, I remember they were doing something on the Amazon and then it was just people in their natural environment. But, you know, as a kid to see that and to see, you know, it was, there was new to not me. clothed and all that. Yeah. You know, it was life. It was exactly, you know, and I guess, you know, kind of growing up prude in the United States, sometimes as a kid, you know, you see it and it's shocking, but then you're like, you know, you look back now and you're like, it was just beautiful. You know, it's, it's families with kids and they're surviving in the rainforest. And what national geographic did was they did a great job of just collecting that experience, you know? And as a kid, you're like, that is just such a world away from you, yeah. but they capture it in pictures in, in real time. And really it's what just, it is, is capturing it in pictures. I mean, I think that's what National Geographic, though, the, the writing is fantastic, obviously. What I remember as a little kid is going to my dad's office. He was a dentist and they had him in the, in the waiting room. And I just remember the, the vistas and the photos and really it opening up a world to me. And that's why I'm glad we have Susan today to talk about uh, – the, the impact of National Geographic and their ever expanding footprint that they are. They're in digital, they're in TV, they're in excursions now. And they've done this incredible book about America the Beautiful and a very timely time to be talking about America, obviously with the election and everything that's going on with the pandemic. But I think what's really, really impressive with all these pictures is it brings you back in time to these photos that you remember and the photos that um, are really still inspiring to this day. Well, you know, and, and just the magazine itself, you know, every dentist's office, every doctor's office at our house in bathrooms, you know, just just seeing the yellow border, National Geographic, it's a little smaller than a traditional magazine. I mean, everybody knows this magazine. And it was always what there were two things we had in the 80s. We didn't have Google. We didn't have the Internet, but we had Encyclopedia Britannica and we had 
um, National Geographic. And that's kind of how we did, got all of our research done for, for papers. It was such a good point of reference with the text, the copy that they did, yeah. as well as the photos. Yeah. So it's now one of the top uh, hashtags on Instagram. It's at Nat Geo. So make sure that you, you follow them. They have over 140 million followers and they are working towards trying to beat Justin Bieber, <laughs> which I thought was really funny. Let's get them over the top. And All right. And because we have Susan, we're going to dedicate this entire episode to National Geographic because um, I think you'll find, you know, with our philosophy here at Destination Everywhere, Everywhere is National Geographic. They are everywhere. And I think a lot of the stuff that we will talk about will turn into bucket list items. You know, all of these amazingly photographed, you know, places and people. Yeah. And we're also going to share with you um, top uh, most photographed uh, destinations, monuments, buildings. Vistas. So it's going to be a really, really, really fun show. So everyone stay tuned. We are excited to have Editor-in-Chief Susan Goldberg from National Geographic. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Destination Everywhere. We are really excited to have our next guest. Our next guest is Susan Goldberg, and Susan is the Editor-in-Chief of National Geographic. So welcome, Susan. Thank you so much. I'm so delighted to be here. Well, we are so happy to have you. Going through your bio, you know, you've know, you done some pretty amazing things and, and have been awarded some, some great recognition, you personally, as well as the magazine, since you've been Editor-in-Chief. But uh, you are actually, and I don't know if people know this, the first editor-in-chief who is female in the 125 years of the magazine's existence, since 19, or 1888, I should say. That's incredible. So I, what took so long, and, and how did you get that spot? <laughs> well, it is funny. You know, National Geographic was founded in 1888. Um, I became the editor in chief in 2014. So I like to say it took 125 years to find the right woman for the job. Well, it's about time. <laughs> but I, I, you know, I'm sure I won't be the last female editor of National Geographic. Um, I don't really know what took so long, except that it's taken a long time for women to achieve those kinds of positions in a lot of places. It's taken way too long. And, you know, what I always like to say is it's great to be first. And I'm really humbled and honored to have this position. Uh, but it's going to be a lot better of a society when there aren't so many female firsts, right? When people don't right. write national news stories when a woman is put in charge because it's just the normal course of doing business, whether that business is journalism or law or politics or banking or whatever. Absolutely. Absolutely. I look forward to that day. Yeah. So, you know, I'm a huge fan. So I'm just going to show you right now here if you're watching online. So I, I, I get your books all the time. It was just such kismet that we were getting to interview you on this. So this is uh, Destinations of a Lifetime. Love this book. I'm a huge hiker and I've got your hundred hikes uh, to do. And the, the books are just so incredible. And I really want to dive into uh, the book itself because the pictures and the pictorials are amazing. And my first question is really around how do you even select, start even selecting, you know, a limited number of photos to really encapsulate America? I mean, it must've been a, a huge ask. Well, you know, it's so interesting. People ask me this all the time because the America, the beautiful book is based on the information in the National Geographic archives. And our archives span back to our founding. So over three centuries, right? The wow. 19th and 20th and now the 21st. And we have 64 million print and digital images in our archives. So the first thing we did in writing America the Beautiful is we took all of those gorgeous pictures that we have from all over the rest of the world and we put them aside. Yeah. <laughs> so we were just, just focusing on, on pictures of the United States, the territories and Washington DC. You know, we tried to find photos in sort of three big areas. One is just epic landscape pictures, right? We all are reminded of the vast beauty of the United States by looking at this book. We wanted to have pictures that capture, you know, the diversity of the wildlife in the United States as well. And then finally, and I'd say even more important than anything else, is pictures of people, both, yeah. you know, historic and up through the modern day that can help tell the story of America and, you know, why America is such a, a unique place and, 
I think paging through this book, it reminded me a little bit of driving across the country. And that's the feeling that I hope other people get from it too. No, without a doubt. There's, there's a couple of pictures that stand. There's one, I think it was in Arkansas that had uh, a little boy and his dad in, you know, basically a four wheel tractor, just driving on a farm. And the boy's kind of, you know, looking back a little bit. And, and then you, you kind of flip the page and, and then there's, you know, uh, a path, a cart path, uh, a hiking path. And then you see this mountain lion looking right at the photographer, you know, and it couldn't have been more than 20 feet away. And then you're kind of like, whoa, you know, so from people to nature, to the landscaping, like you said, it really kind of blows your mind. You kind of realize how, how amazing the country is when you look at it in pictures. Yeah. And my, my favorite one, uh, Susan, I don't know if you remember this one, it's the, the 1957 photo of the, the Mayflower two coming into New York Harbor. Um, had just crossed. I actually have seen that picture before. I didn't know it was a National Geographic. I should have assumed because it's such a fantastic shot because it's a U.S. Navy blimp uh, hovering over this this replica of the Mayflower. And it's just it just says so many things in one photo. And that's one thing I've always loved about National Geographic is you see a photo and it makes you think not only of what's in the photo, but what's surrounding the photo and the emotion that most of these photos uh, pull out of you is just simply incredible. Do you have a do you have several fa favorite photos from this book? You know, this is like asking me to pick among my, <laughs> my children. Luckily, I only have one, though, so that's actually not my problem. Um, there is a photo in here that just harkens back to my childhood. I was just looking at it. It's from 1965, and it's in New York, and it's all of these people looking out of the crown of the Statue of yes. Liberty oh, yeah. when people were still allowed to go up there, right? Yep. They haven't been allowed up there in a really long time. And it's taken kind of at eye level. It's an aerial photo taken by our, our photographer, William Albert All Allard. You know, it's just yeah. kind of a throwback photo, but it's a great photo. Yeah, and I think next to it, you see the the torch on the ground, uh, just her hand in the torch, like it's being ready to be installed. Exactly, and that's one of those juxtapositions. This book is full of photos juxtaposed against each other. So here are two views of the Statue of Liberty, one of her face and her crown, and one of the torch on the, gro uh, on the ground, you know, yep. before it's being installed. And it's all of these juxtapositions, not only do you look at the photo, each photo, but you look at them together. And it kind of makes you stop and think about the relationship between the photos. And our, you know, our photo editors and book editors are very clever in that way of seeing, you know, seeing similarities in sometimes very disparate scenes. Well, and I notice also the captions don't give away too much. They 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 touch on the photos but they don't go into a really big background on each of the photos. So I, it leaves a lot to your imagination when you're actually looking at them. It, I agree. It'll, um, and, and something else that you guys do in, in this book is you take a, a native son or daughter from that state or territory, and you kind of get their personal story as an introduction. You know, how did you select those individuals? You know, that was really hard uh, because we wanted to find people whose names were known, but people who also had authentic and legitimate connections to the That's state. Uh -huh. So when I when we went to Ohio, for example, to me, the obvious choice there was LeBron James. You know, I used to I used to be the editor of the Plain Dealer newspaper in in Cleveland, the largest paper in Ohio. And we covered LeBron James when he was playing for the Cavaliers, of course. And LeBron James is a multi-millionaire, world-famous athlete, and yet his connection to Ohio is so legitimate. And I just love what he said. Uh, we quoted all of these people in the book, and what LeBron James said was, before anyone ever cared where I would play basketball, I was a kid from Northeast Ohio. In Northeast Ohio, nothing is given, everything is earned. You work for what you have. No matter where I go in the world, Ohio will always be home. And just in those few sentences, I think he did a beautiful job in capturing what each of our home states mean, mean to us. And, you know, that authentic connection that he has really rings out in, in those sentences. And I just, I just loved it. Yeah, I think that what I've noticed about a lot of these quotes is how people talk about how the, um, the area or the state or the region 
uh, came with them after they left, like uh, President Obama's comments around Hawaii, how the people are always with him and, and what he learned has made him a better person. I thought that oh, was Oh yeah, incredible. I mean, Nick Saban, the football coach, you yeah. know, the college football coach does that too, writing about West Virginia where he grew up. Now, you know, as he says, I've been gone for many years, but my West Virginia roots helped define my life in more ways than I, than I can count. I met my wife there and learned what it meant to be part of a team. Well, nice. clearly nothing more important for, for him than that, but people just had these wonderful stories about places, really warm, loving stories. I mean, it'll just blow your mind. You could look through it all day long. And then, and then you know, my parents would get something out of this different than I do, you know, cause you were talking about growing up uh, and, and one picture kind of triggering a memory and, and there's so much that, that they would enjoy and probably be like, I absolutely remember that. You know, I remembered when that happened, which is, it did such a wonderful job in selecting the photos. You can look at them all day long. Well, you know, one of the things I do like about this book is how the photos are really juxtaposed against the poem that we all know, America yeah. the Beautiful. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, this was a poem written in 1893, and a lot of people, once it got put to music, really thought it should have been the national anthem. And all of us know the first stanza, but there are four stanzas to this poem. You know, it's the one that is, oh, beautiful for spacious skies, right? right. And there's tons of pictures in this book that bring that home. But what I love is, so Catherine Lee Bates, she writes this poem. She's a young woman. She's an English professor, I think, at Wellesley College. And she takes a train trip across the country. And when she gets to Kansas, she's struck by for amber waves of grain. And when she gets to Colorado, she sees for Purple Mountain's majesty, right? And so it was that journey that led to this poem. And it is it is so, so well told. And it's when you get down into the poem, you get to the second, third, and fourth stanzas. It's a very patriotic poem, but it also kind of acknowledges some of the flaws of the country. It talks about, you know, thine alabaster city's gleam, and she's writing about Chicago there, undimmed by human tears. So she's also hinting that the country has issues too. And I, I think it's a very interesting poem when you read the whole thing. And anyway, that sort of laces its way through the whole book. That's nice. And you have the photos and, uh, to, go, to go along with it. I'd like to ask you about the photographers, because I've always been really, really curious about how you've curated the best photographers in the world and how the relationship with them um, uh, has grown over the years and how they have contributed to this book. So this comes out of, as we said, the National Geographic Archive. So all of these people who are in here, and of course, not all of them are living anymore, but these were all people who you know, could call themselves National Geographic photographers. To this day, we work with, regularly work with about, oh, I'd say about 150 photographers on a regular basis. These photographers work, now you can see them on our Instagram account, on oh, our great. Nat Geo Instagram account. You know, we're the most uh, followed brand on Instagram, not too surprisingly. We've got about 145 million followers. Wow. People who have more followers are celebrities. So we are right behind Justin Bieber in terms of followers. <laughs> That's but cool. I am not, I am not impressed <laughs> until we pass Kim Kardashian. Um, you know, we, we are hot on the trail of Kim Kardashian. So these are, these are photographers, uh, certainly from around the world. And, you know, we work with them all the time on all kinds of different stories. You know, this was just looking at an American story, but for, you know, every issue of the magazine and for our, our content on our digital platforms that goes out every single day, we are working with this uh, increasingly diverse group of photographers around the world. You know, it started out basically all white men. It is now basically 50-50 uh, women and men, and we are working very hard to make sure we have more photographers who are people of color. That's fantastic. So, so do the photographers, um, well, one, they put themselves in such dangerous positions sometimes, which, you know, I, to be a photographer for National Geographic, it's more than just being a photographer. You have to have this, uh, I don't, a, a way to control your fear, like, like nobody's Yeah, you have to business. be brave, right? <laughs> um, Fearless. Do the photographers, do they create the story for you, or are you sending them on a story for a specific reason because you know sometimes you never you know does the picture come before that story or did they have the story and then create the photo 
So it's both really. Sometimes photographers will propose stories to us, right, of expeditions they want to go on. And, you know, they're, they're talking about the story that they could tell if they went to the Serengeti and covered, you know, the migration of the wildebeest. And this is the kind of story that they could tell. Or sometimes we are, we assign uh, stories. But as you say, our photographers do incredible things. So we did a, a special issue back in July on Mount Everest. Well, so if you're going to be a writer or a photographer uh, doing a special issue on Mount Everest, not only do you have to be a great photographer and a great writer, you also have to be a great climber, right? <laughs> so you, <laughs> most photographers can't climb Mount Everest and take pictures of it, right? at the same time. And, and that is true of the writers as well. So we're asking people to do a lot of specialized things. Now, um, you, you also, there was, you know, everybody knows the picture of the Afghan girl with the, with the amazing eyes looking right at the camera, you know, and that's just kind of, it becomes part of an international landscape. You guys present the initial story, but then everybody wants to know a follow-up. And I think with her specifically, there was a follow-up and I don't know, did you guys facilitate the follow-up on that young woman? We we did. So uh, her name is Sharbat Gula, and everybody just knows her as the Afghan girl. And the initial picture was taken by Steve McCurry in Afghanistan in 1984. And it, that photo just tells you the power of a still single image. Absolutely. Um, you know, we're all into moving pictures and video now, but mm -hmm. that really reminds you of the power of a one image. And, you know, it brought worldwide attention to the plight of Afghan refugees more than any story could have that image. And honestly, I go, I used to anyway, go around the world quite a bit. And everywhere you go, you see that picture, you know, people have mm -hmm. it cut out and you see mock-ups of it and takeoffs of it. And it's just, it's probably one of the most famous pictures of the 20th century. I don't think there's any no question, no it. question about it. Yeah. 17 years later, 17 years later, mm -hmm. we went back with that photographer and a writer to find her and wow. to see what had become of her. And we did a, we did a, another story about it. Now, I think she uh, she's actually Pakistani. I think she has returned now to to Pakistan. But, um, you know, she she has had a hard life, really, mm -hmm. you know, being a refugee. And I think her husband died and one of her children died. And, you know, so she. Uh, was only about 12 or 13 when that original picture was taken. She was maybe in her early 40s when the follow-up came, but you could tell that she had lived a very difficult life. Without a doubt. And, and, and you guys also do a lot to promote education, conservation with, with children. I know, um, you know, it seems every year as, as a birthday gift, we get the, the National Geographic uh, for Kids, the little publication that comes out that, that makes things so simple for them, but it gets them engaged in, in yeah. such a way, you know, because of uh, one of yours, uh, our son is like the biggest whale shark fan, you know, and it was, I oh. think it was, you know, and it's those little things that you guys have done. How does that kind of work in, in the big picture? Because I'm, I'm just trying to understand National Geographic as an organization, because you guys do span over many different industries. Um, whether it's retail, these excursions that uh, I was reading about yeah, that are digital. just absolutely seem amazing to me. Digital, I, you know, how, can you kind of explain kind of the structure of National Geographic? Yeah, I don't think most people really realize how big of an organization it is. And it's an organization that's broken into two parts. So first, there's my part. We're called National Geographic Partners. We are 73% owned now by the Walt Disney Company, 27% owned by the nonprofit National Geographic Society, which uh, works specifically with teachers and scientists and, and um, sends uh, explorers out into the field. They discover something, then you know, we write about it and publicize it. But on the, on the for-profit side, so you know, we have a whole publications business with you know, National Geographic Magazine, our kids magazine, our little kids magazine, our history magazine, our newsstand special magazines. We have a television business, the National Geographic Channel. Yep, we yep. produce a podcast. We have a huge digital business. We have the largest digital outreach of any media brand, whether from our Instagram account or across our social channels with Facebook, Twitter. We've got nationalgeographic.com. So we are kind of out there 
everywhere. And right. uh, you can find National Geographic in a lot of ways. And of course, the fastest growing part of our business is the digital part of our business. You sure. know, it's a digital future, really. Yeah, I thought in, uh, in your bio, I saw you're an advocate for cross-platform storytelling across all these platforms. So you have absolutely landed in the right spot. I mean, because you are able to really make an impression across all different types of platforms. Well, and because that's, you reach different audiences on different platforms, right? So for our monthly print magazine, National National Geographic magazine, that audience is going to tend to be a little bit older, right? Because for those of us who grew up reading print, there's something really nice, lean back experience. But to reach that, you know, new generation of readers and users, we need to be all over digital and especially all over mobile platforms. And you know, that, that is the future and how, as we go forward, more and more people will connect to us across those digital platforms. Absolutely. I see that you guys are, uh, were a finalist for the Pulitzer Prize for feature photography, no surprise in 2019. Congratulations about that. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about that experience about being nominated? Yeah, we were the finalist twice actually in recent years in, um, in 2017, we were a finalist for explanatory reporting around our gender issue. And then in um, 19, we were a finalist for a story we did about a face transplant, an amazing story about a young woman uh, who was getting a face transplant at the Cleveland Clinic. You know, we, were, we spent almost two years as part of her life and part of her oh, wow. family's life going in and out of the Cleveland Clinic while she underwent all of those procedures. And it was a very moving story because it wasn't really just a story about breakthrough medicine and science. It was a story about a young woman's resilience and her family's love. And that's why I think people connected to that story so much. Yeah, absolutely. I remember that feature. And I remember sitting down with my daughter um, and, and looking at that and, and trying to explain. And it pictures, you know, for a young girl it was a very easy way for her to understand that. And she has a passion for for helping people. So I think, you know, they really conveyed that through the story. Good. I'm, I'm so glad to hear that because I think it was an important story for, for young people. And, you know, this young woman, her name is Katie Stubblefield, wants to help other young, you know, young people. Well, it's an incredible book. I think, would you call this a coffee table book? Yes, I would call it a coffee table book. Some people call them mouse killers, but I don't think that's <laughs> <laughs> that's great that's well, great. nice i didn't really say that no. <laughs> this is pg it's all right it's all right you know uh, and when, when you were creating this book you know that you must have had um an idea of what you wanted the viewer and the reader to feel when they they put it down and uh, you know obviously you know these are volatile times you know and then sometimes people forget you know even in our own backyard you know, things are happening so differently for other people that really aren't that far away. You know, we all live on the same soil. What, what was kind of the idea? What did you want people to take away from the book? We knew we were going to publish it at the time of a divisive election. So I think we wanted to remind people that we have a lot more in common than, than what divides us. And I think we were also hoping people would feel inspired. Um, and to me, that's the biggest takeaway. I learned a lot actually about the poem, America the Beautiful, about the creation of it, about the young woman who wrote it. But then I also just felt like I learned a lot about parts of the country where I haven't been. I haven't been to every state. And so, you know, when I read about Vermont, for example, which is incredibly a state I have never been to, I don't understand how I've managed not to get to Vermont, but it, you know, it makes me feel like, wow, I've really got to step up my game as soon as I can and travel to the places that I haven't been because it's, it's just a beautiful country and every single place has something to offer. And this is a big reminder of that. Absolutely. Absolutely. And matter, matter of fact, we did, we did a podcast on Vermont um, oh. and spoke to Ben and Jerry's and talked to all, all the locals there. And it's just such an amazing, an amazing destination. So you got to get up there. You don't live too far from it. So you got to get up there. It's a short drive. I know I have no excuse whatsoever. <laughs> Great. Well, Susan, before we let you go, we ask all of our guests to uh, answer our rapid fire questions because most of our guests are world travelers, as, as I'm sure you are. And uh, you've probably been to a lot of places being with National Geographic. Um, but we ask these questions so you can convey to our listeners tips and tricks of what you've done and uh, give some of your personal experience. Are you ready? Yep. All right, here we go. So have you ever completed anything on your personal bucket list? And if so, what was it? Uh, oh, gosh, so many. Um, 
Last year, I went to Bhutan and I took a lot of uh, really amazing hikes. Absolutely. And, wow, that's, a, that's that's incredible. People not, were just- I, I think, because I even think they limit the amount of travelers that can go into Bhutan now. So that's a, that's a big accomplishment. They, we went, we went, it was, for, it was my 60th birthday trip. And I went with another, uh, with a group of women. We were all about the same age. Uh, another woman was also celebrating her 60th. And we just had an amazing time. It's a beautiful country. It's so spiritual, gorgeous, wonderful people, and some really tough hiking. So I think all yeah. of us felt really great having done it. All right. <laughs> Number two, if you live anywhere in the world for a year, where would it be? I mean, this is a boring answer, but I would probably live in Madrid or Paris. I just love both of those cities. Uh -huh. um, you know, they just, they're beautiful. They're vibrant. I would like to learn to speak French, you know, all yeah. of those, all of those very pedantic things. I just think it sounds really fun. Yeah. And you always hear about Paris, but Madrid really is a very, very special city. And it I has love a, Madrid. much of the same feeling as Paris. Absolutely. Exactly. Absolutely. All right. Great. If you could travel with someone infamous or famous, alive or dead, who would it be? My husband? No. Um <laughs> <laughs> Oh, I think it would be very interesting to travel with somebody like um, Maya Angelou or somebody who could, you know, picture the world, unfortunately no longer living, but somebody who would see different things than I would see about the world and who would have the ability to write about it or talk about it in such a magical and insightful way. I would love to travel with somebody like that. That's fantastic. All right, here's a fun one. When you're packing for a trip, what is something that you pack that our listeners might be surprised uh, that you do? Well, I should caveat this by saying I am a terrible packer. <laughs> I, I am really bad. I just take everything. All right. I always travel. <laughs> I'm bad. I'm bad. I always travel, though, with an extension cord. Always. You, you know, you find yourself in all kinds of places where you would think now that everybody understood we needed to plug in all of our devices. But yeah. sometimes you end up with, so I try, you know, where, where the, the only plug, there's one outlet in the room and it's 30 feet away, right? And your bed is over there. So I always travel with a long extension cord. Great suggestion. Great, great suggestion. And finally, what is your most memorable experience since you have been editor in chief at National Geographic? Oh my gosh, so many. Here's what I think it was though. We have a we have a writer who is literally walking around the world. His name is Paul Salapak and uh, he's doing a walk called the Out of Eden Walk. It is a 10 year, 21,000 mile walk. Wow. So right after I got to National Geographic, I went walking with him for a few days only. And we were walking along the border really of Syria and Turkey. And we started talking about the plight of refugees. Nothing brought home to me the plight of refugees than walking along that Syrian Turkish border where you saw the just flood of Syrian people, you know, fleeing that terrible civil war, um, you know, looking for a new start at life. And I will never really, really forget that that particular walk with uh, Paul Salapak. What a one, well, that's once in a lifetime. How incredible for you. Well, Susan, thanks so much. It's been an absolute pleasure. Where can our listeners go to to look at America Beautiful, the book and, and possibly purchase it? Sure. Uh, bookstores anywhere, nationalgeographic.com or on Amazon as well. Great. And what's your Instagram uh, uh, tag again? It's at Nat Geo. Thank you so much for your time. It's been an absolute honor and we wish you the best of success uh, at National Geographic again with the book. Thank you. Oh, thanks to you both. Thank you, Susan. Really, really enjoy talking with you. Are you ready to book your hotel for your next company event or family adventure? Let AMI help. We have ongoing relationships with all major hotel chains and access to over 200,000 hotels. Why us? We receive special promotions before they hit the open market, meaning significant cost savings to you. Go to destination-everywhere.com and click the Source Now button and let us get to work for you. Welcome back to Destination Everywhere, this special edition of uh, National Geographic. It was really, really um, exciting and enlightening to talk to you. Wasn't us, she Goldberg. great? Oh my I, gosh, what energy. No, I absolutely loved her. I mean, and we could have gone on and on, but I know she's very busy and we obviously only have about an hour for our podcast. But I mean, I, I seriously could have talked about, you know, 
yeah. just, it, it, it was endless, but a couple of things you might not know about Susan. And we, and we didn't talk about him in the interview because we really wanted to focus on, on the publication. Um, but in 2013, she was voted one of Washington DC's most influential women in the media by Washingtonian magazine. Wow. 2017. And again, in 19, Washingtonian named Susan among the most powerful women in Washington DC across. She's platform. definitely uh, a player. No question right, about that. Uh, across professions in uh, 2020 in style magazine included Susan on it. Get this badass 50 list naming her number seven in the issue about wow. women, about women who are changing the world. And she really uh, has a passion for what she's doing, which is incredible. And, and obviously Susan lives in DC, but you know, she's, she's just got, you know, amazing accolades. The publication is just over the top. Everybody knows it. It's a wonderful, wonderful publication. So, you know, with that said, I, I we thought it would be fun to go into some, some photography and um, talk about some of the most photographed, um, you know, like we said, vistas, buildings, hotels, uh, specifically also. Yeah. Cause know, these can be bucket list items too, right? Well, we wanted to include hotels, yeah, because that's really our niche. You know, we're, we're going to these places. But these vistas, you know, I was going through them all, and I was like, they each kind of, you know, could become a bucket list item for somebody yeah, who wants for sure. to, to travel. So let's jump right into these, because I thought they were really interesting. And so with the help of our producer, we got to, you know, we did some research and found out some of the, uh, the most photographs. Well, we're going to start with destination. And where would you think, Andy, the most photographed destination in the world is? I would say it had to be either Paris or New York. Well, it's New York City. And, ah, uh, I got it right. You know, and I don't know the metrics that they use for these, but I mean, how many times has anybody seen the skyline of New York? It's used yeah. in backgrounds all over the world, but it's absolutely gorgeous. But some other uh, honorable mentions were London, Paris, Dubai, Singapore, Rome, Istanbul, and surprisingly... Seattle, I get, but I, I shouldn't say surprisingly, but because Seattle's an amazing city, but uh, that was just a smaller one that I was kind of surprised was on. Yeah, there. I mean, but I mean, the vista of Mount Rainier with the Space Needle is something you'll never forget. I mean, it, it really is gorgeous. You know, there are few uh, cities that can compete with Seattle in the summertime from a beauty perspective. It's absolutely beautiful. Uh, we went there um, summer of 2018. And we pretty much spent the entire time walking around the city because it was so gorgeous and the views were so amazing. So I'm not surprised at all that Seattle's up there. No, and neither am I. My, my first trip to Seattle, I caught the the top of Rainier above the clouds as we were going in. It yeah. was uh, unforgettable. Yeah, we definitely need to do a destination everywhere, but we regress. So, so what I'm a little surprised about is Dubai, just because it's one of the newest cities that is is really well photographed. And the hotel there that shaped like a, the sail, the uh, Burj Al Arab, is one of the most uh, uh, photographed hotels. And because in, the skyline is very, very, very photographed because of it. Well, yeah, and I think the Burj Al Arab put... Dubai on the map in exactly, terms of yeah. put it on the map in terms of architecture. But then you're also seeing the the world islands pop up and then the Palm Islands, which are the man-made islands that that look uh, like the world and bombs. Yeah. Uh, but then they also have the tallest building right now, which is the Burj Khalifa, which uh, you know, we'll we have a in another podcast, uh, uh, somebody from Dubai who who was talking about his elevator experience at the Burj Khalifa. So you'll have to stay tuned for that one. Yeah. So the you know the Al Arab, it's just absolutely gorgeous, stunning, really high, high end. They claim to be seven stars, even though there's nothing, uh, there's no one that actually gives seven stars. But we planned a meeting there, and it, it is absolutely gorgeous and something that everyone should see. Uh, speaking of hotels. Uh, let's talk about some of the most photographed hotels and a lot of these There's some great ones, you know, and I'm going through the list and, and, you know, uh, you know, we've actually planned meetings at a lot of these properties. So um, the first one actually hails from our neighbor to the north of us, uh, Quebec, and it's in Quebec city. And that is the Fairmont. The uh, it looks like the, the Cinderella castle, the Le Chateau Frontenac, which is absolutely amazing. We actually stayed there uh, in 2018 and it is as beautiful in person as it is in photographs. It's absolutely amazing. Well, it's it's on the uh, St. Lawrence River, and it kind of juts up like a, I mean, like a castle off the river up this uh, huge winding road. And it's just, I mean, it's one of those fairy tale uh, situations. And they just went through a multi million dollar renovation, and it, it really really is gorgeous. So I'm not surprised. And just the vista from the St. Lawrence is so beautiful. 
Uh, I'm not surprised at all. It's, and that's actually that's, that's actually point. another one. We have an interview with yeah. the Chateau Frontenac. So, uh, you know, you'll have to, to follow that when we hit on Quebec City in another uh, podcast. But uh, the, the second one we just talked about is uh, the Burj Al Arab. So the, and that's the, the Jermia property. But yeah. um, that was actually also designed and it, it, it looks like a sale, like you mentioned, Andy. It has that helicopter pad. And I think there was a- Yeah, a, the helicopter pad, right? Yeah, and it, there was a commercial that was filmed on that helicopter pad. It was, uh, I think it was a Nike commercial. I don't want to get it wrong, but it, it was Agassi and somebody else playing tennis up there. And oh, it was, yeah, yeah. if you've got vertigo, it, it just kind of makes <laughs> your stomach queasy. But uh, well, here's one of my favorite ones, um, just because uh, every November we go to New York City and uh, enjoy Thanksgiving up there. And you've got to stop by the Plaza Hotel right off of Central Park. It is uh, decked out to the nines for the holidays. And um, it's it's such a big footprint. And so it's just right there and you can't miss it. And, and it's just classic New York. All the history of New York. And um, they've and got- It was in Home Alone 1 or 2. Heloise, the, the stories about the little girl yeah. uh, living in the plaza. And uh, can I share one quick story about the plaza? Sure. Uh, it was- the day Catherine Zeta Jones and uh, Michael Douglas got married, and there was a group of us walking in, and they stopped the group. But we were planning some, a meeting, right? We were planning. We were, yeah, we were planning a meeting, and and I got in and uh, was able. And this was the day all the celebrities were coming in for the wedding. I think Michael Jackson, Liza Minnelli, and I still don't know how I got in. Then I got I got in pretty far, and then I got nervous, so I turned around and I walked out. I was like, why didn't I just keep going? But um, but that it's obviously an amazing property. And then let's oh, go. Well, let, let, let me just mention something else. They've got a great food court at the bottom of it that yes, I'm, I'm sure locals know about it, but I don't think a whole lot of tourists know about it. It's uh, right in the basement level and it just goes on forever. It has all these great little food kiosks that you can eat all different international foods. So if you're um, going to buy Central Park and want to uh, get an affordable bite, uh, buy it, just go into the, the plaza and just head straight downstairs. Yeah, and if you look, there's a spire on top, um, yep. and that is actually Tommy Hilfiger's uh, apartment up there. He lives up there with his wife. But oh wow, um, yeah, I saw an amazing tour of that online. And then, and then you know, another one. Let's go to um, Singapore. Uh, it's the Marina Bay Sands property, and it's got a massive rooftop, an infinity pool, and another connects- one you see in commercials a lot. You, yeah, and, and you you actually see it a lot in movies as well. So look um, that one up. It's it's really really impressive. Right. And then, and then the pool actually connects three buildings and it overlooks Marina Bay. So absolutely a gorgeous property. And our last one is uh, a place where we've done a lot of business and taken a lot of our clients to for meetings is the Bellagio in Vegas with those iconic fountains that are set to music and also the Cholula glass inside the main lobby. Unbelievably beautiful. So not surprised it's one of the most photographed hotels in the world. Yeah, I think that I think the Bellagio really kind of set a new standard for Vegas in terms of um, upping its game with elegance instead of the traditional lights and sounds of slot machines. But the artwork in there is supposed yeah. to be just, you know, original art, amazing, you know, beautiful pieces, uh, and very, very expensive from what All I right. hear. Todd, you ready to talk about landmarks, the top landmarks? I think there's not gonna be any surprise to the the, the number one photograph landmark on the planet uh, yeah no I, I i i would have guessed that actually number you one want to tell the, you want to tell the audience it was built in 1889 for a world's fair and uh it is actually the eiffel tower in paris and uh no surprise absolutely just it's a the most thing. visited uh monument in the world followed quickly by big ben in london which is another iconic one um big ben actually only refers to the bell itself the actual tower is called the elizabeth tower i don't think a lot of people know that i you know what i did not know that i I think i heard it but i think i forgot it then we have another one we're going to go back to paris is uh the louvre and of course everybody knows the iconic um triangle right at the entrance of the louvre which uh was it's kind of a relatively new feature um it's it hasn't been around since i was a kid but uh it is new and it's extremely photographed Another one we're coming back to the States for. If you had to say a building in the States, which would you say? Uh, gosh, I'd either say, well, definitely the Empire State Building. Is it the Empire State? It's, it's the Empire State yeah, Building. We can just sure. say that. Yeah. Um, another iconic building in movies, but, uh, you know, right in the middle of uh, Manhattan skyline. We're going, we're getting, we're talking on Burj Khalifa again. Um, the Apparently this is on three of our lists now. So uh, 
Burj Khalifa is definitely a bucket list destination, the world's yeah, tallest building. Sure. And then some other honorable mentions, which these kind of surprised me that they weren't higher on the list. But uh, uh, the Statue of Liberty, I thought. I know, I, right? I thought that would have been in top two. Yeah. Um, uh, Notre Dame in, uh -huh. in Paris. In Paris, yeah. Uh, the Sagrada Familia, which is, you know, the building that's been eternally under construction in yeah, Barcelona. In Barcelona, it's the church um, that is, uh, I think, still uh, slotted for another 50 years or something. To yeah, I think they just moved the scaffolding around and then start again because yeah, I've never they're, trying, they're trying to keep they're trying to keep to the, the art form and um, right. his vision. So um, it's going to be it's going to be a while. So the Coliseum in Rome, which is uh, obviously really it, what's interesting about the Coliseum when you go there is you know, there's roads all around it and it's kind of like the the pyramids in e egypt is not actually quite easy to get your picture in front of it because of all of it so you had to kind of go across the street to get it but it's definitely one of the most uh one of the most photographed because right. if you want the shot you want you're going to get hit by a car because right. yeah there's, there's roads <laughs> you got to be there's, careful there's roads going all around it then we also have the um Machu Picchu, you know yeah. and uh, you know everybody they all must stand in line to get this one shot because the picture everybody takes of Machu Picchu is from the same angle, uh, from but same obviously vista. from the same vista, Red Square. Yeah, and that's, and you that's know very popular, right? And, you know, I think that's just a, a cool one because you go back to the Soviet Union days and you see pictures of the Red Square and it's obviously much different than it yeah. is. Not, not the architecture, but yeah, the and, atmosphere. Yeah, and what I love is uh, Christ the Redeemer um, in uh, Rio de Janeiro. Um, you know, hanging over the, uh, looking over the the city from the, from the mountaintop. Definitely one that you want to see. Taj Mahal in India. You know, if you go through and and you that you see the bench that's right in front of Taj Mahal, there's famous pictures of uh, uh, Princess Diana there, and and I think uh, Prince William and Kate may have recreated that, but uh, obviously just a beautiful building, Mount Fuji. Mount Fuji is uh, one, obviously, that is no surprise with the white caps on the mountains. Yeah, it's gorgeous. gorgeous. Yeah, the fountain. Let's say uh, there's a fountain that's up in this list. Which fountain would you guess that is? And it's <sighs> not. It's not the fountains at the Bellagio. Okay, fountains. What country does a lot of fountains? Um, okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna choose Rome, uh, and maybe the Trevi Fountain. It's the Trevi Fountain. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so obviously very well photographed, beautiful, uh, sculptures in the Trevi yeah. Fountain. And, and a hint about the Tre Trevi Fountain. Um, I've been there several times and if you go during the day, a complete madhouse, however, it is really, really well lit and you can go at midnight and it'd be empty or yeah, 1 a.m. Yeah. and still, still be able to get some great ego shots and be able to see it, um, without a lot of people around. So, uh, that's uh, just a, a great recommendation. And then, and then the last one, you know, obviously I think this is kind of a cheat, but because it is so long. <laughs> so I, you know, there's, there's really no way of not photographing it when you're in China, but the great wall of China, um, yeah. you know, and, and I, I don't know if there's one point of the wall that's more popular than others, but obviously that's a, a an architectural wonder. All right. And the last thing we're going to talk about are vistas. So the most photographed vistas on the planet. Now, what is a vista? A vista is a view from a certain point. So um, I don't think any of these are going to be a surprise, but uh, they are definitely ones that you want to put on your bucket list. So the first one, Todd, is in the U.S. and it is the Grand Canyon. So I was lucky enough to do the Grand Canyon uh, with my dad, uh, a 10 day trip. Oh my gosh, unbelievable bucket list, put it on there. However, the views um, and the number of different vistas you can get of the Grand Canyon are, you know, countless. So but you, you, should, you want to see. Yeah, you, you should mention that was a rafting trip through the Grand Canyon. It was, it was incredible. Another one is Niagara Falls. And uh, we get to see Niagara Falls from two different countries. We have the Canadian side and then we have the U.S. side. So both have beautiful vantage points. So depending on what you're looking for, each one kind of has a different feel. Yeah, and, has a great, and in Canada has a great ice wine uh, tour that you can do with lots of ice wine vineyards. So put that on your bucket list too. That's a lot of fun. Yeah, supposedly that Niagara on the lake right there is the only place that makes legitimate ice wine. Again, I don't know if that's true, but I think they claim that there. And uh, another one, San Francisco Bay. Yeah, San Francisco uh, Bay. And I that's mean, a, you know, from, and I'm surprised uh, that wasn't on uh, Golden Gate Bridge wasn't a, a, a most photographed landmark. I, that kind of shocks me. Yeah, I'm sure it is. I'm sure it is. 
Um, so the, the Florence cityscape is another one that's um, quite popular and, and, and really, really beautiful. If you haven't been to Florence, uh, definitely take your camera. The old architecture is a photographer's dream. And then here's one. We actually did a podcast about this, but uh, the West Coast of Ireland. Absolutely. Um, the the amazing cliffs overlooking the ocean with the rocks. You remember below. how to say it, Todd, from the podcast? Uh, the Cliffs of Moher. 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 Mo- <laughs> but <laughs> it's hard. It's, it's hard. The, the, the Cliffs of Moher. Moher. Uh, everyone's seen that photo. It's those jutting, uh, those jutting cliffs that um, you can walk right up to the edge. It's, it's, it's pretty incredible. And the next one is not going to be any surprise to anyone, I think, is Versailles. I mean, unbelievably gorgeous. And the vistas that they're talking about are actually the uh, gardens, which we actually went to a 4th of July event. Actually, it was Bastille Day. Bastille Day. Yep. <laughs> it was Bastille Day. Um, so at night, and actually, I think they do it every weekend, though, they have fireworks. Um, and you, they limit the number of people that go there, and they have wine and cheese, and you get to just wander immense gardens back there. They just go on forever, and then there's beautiful fireworks. So definitely try to put that on your bucket list. One of those kind of special nights uh, that I'll never forget. It was, it, it really was uh, a beautiful night, and the uh, the gardens themselves are still to this day, probably the, the most beautiful in the world. All right. For our next visit, we're going to go down to Italy and uh, it's the Amalfi Coast. And uh, yeah, the Amalfi Coast is absolutely gorgeous. It looks like everything you've seen in pictures, it, it, you know, even better in real life. But but to see it from the water, uh, we did it by boat. And I remember coming into Positano, you you just look at it and it was actually at night. So um, it, the, the lights, you know, you see it stacked up on the mountain. Uh, absolutely, absolutely gorgeous. Yeah, it's just really beautiful. Really, really beautiful. So definitely not 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 a, not a surprise. And then the next one is the Serengeti in Tanzania. Um, everybody uh, uh, sees the, the, the wildebeest run that, that happens each year um, during the Great Migration. Uh, but definitely one of the most uh, photographed for sure. And then we're going to come back. We already talked about this, but obviously the Manhattan skyline, um, yeah. you know, classic. Every, it, just classic. I mean, they, what, what more can you say about it? It's, it's just, uh, uh, I enjoy it every time I fly in, it's just spectacular to see. Yeah. And the last one that kind of surprised me, uh, not that, not that it, it doesn't get photographed a lot, but just that, um, I, I wouldn't have thought of it is the, the Hong Kong Harbor. Yeah. I, that is an interesting one. And now that you think about, it, and I think about some of the pictures, it's, it's, it's as spectacular as really the Manhattan skyline is it's uh, yeah. because it's, it's right on the water, but then the city and the architecture there is absolutely striking. It's great. Right. And then, and finally, here are some most photographic, just other top. Uh, we couldn't get to all these, all these lists, but here are some number ones um, from across the world. So uh, from our hometown, the most uh, photographed beach on the planet is Miami beach. No surprise there. Nope. You got the deco, beautiful neon lights and uh, always, uh, always a vibrant crowd on, on Miami. Yeah, Beach. for sure. And then the most uh, f- photographed uh, opera house. I think this is no surprise to anybody. The Sydney opera house in uh, Sydney, Australia. Uh, yep. You can uh, absolutely uh, get great uh, photos of that from whatever, whatever location you are down there on the, uh, on the shoreline. And then we have um, the skyline, New York. We actually just talked about that. The, the the most photographed national park. We've already touched on that one as well. Also, Grand Canyon. And then event. We were trying to look for events. And we yeah. did find one that kind of blew the rest of them out of the water. And, um, and this is the annual Albuquerque International Balloon Festival. Oh, of course. Uh, so yeah, that takes place one. in early October in um, Albuquerque, New Mexico. So, uh, you know, check some of those out. And, and then, you know, think about those lists and, and, you know, look at your bucket list. You know, do, do these have a place in them? And I think they probably will, because I know after reading these, especially that last one, I, I, yeah. that the balloon festival or the balloon fiesta, I should say. Well, Todd, um, yeah, it's it, this has been an incredible show. I, I, I can't thank... Susan, enough for being uh, being on the show and helping us with photography and bucket list photography uh, areas and her new book, America the Beautiful, that focuses specifically on great Nat Geo shots from the last hundred years. 
um, and put it into all in all one coffee book, I think was a great idea and something that's a, that's a great gift and something that people will really, really enjoy perusing as they, as they look through it. No, the, the, the photographs will definitely, if, if you're not moved by the photos or if you're not, if your memory is not triggered by something, you know, I, there's just something not right because all of them are just striking the nature, the people and the vistas that they show are just over the top. Absolutely gorgeous photography. Yeah, well, so special thanks to Susan once again. Thank you, Susan. And um, we'd also like to thank our team here. Uh, and we'd like to thank Chris Jordan, our copywriter, Guy Quattlebaum, our content developer, Annie Fernandez, our creative director, and of course, uh, the amazing researcher, Lauren Campbell, our podcast producer. So if you enjoyed this podcast, please be sure you subscribe, rate, and review. Uh, the show on your preferred podcast app are by going to www.destination-everywhere.com. So, so we look forward to seeing you next time on Destination Everywhere. You've just tuned in to another episode of Destination Everywhere with travel and hospitality entrepreneurs, Todd Bloodworth and Andy McNeil. To access the show notes and other helpful resources, visit destination-everywhere.com. Join us again next week for another bucket list filled show as we feature another travel worthy destination. Until next time, travel well and be safe out there.